friends just made a podcast. Two good friends just made a podcast. Two good friends just made a podcast. It's called Culture Bucket. Two good friends just made a podcast. Two good friends just made a podcast. Two good friends just made a podcast. Culture Bucket. George and Anne. Welcome back to Culture Bucket, the greatest podcast in the universe ever, ever, ever. Welcome to our 90th episode. This is the podcast where two best friends talk all things pop culture and um, argue about it. <laughs> um, one of those best friends is me, George, who you're hearing now, and the other is Alex. Hi, Alex. Hi, George. Hi, everyone. We haven't Hi. argued in a while, though, George. Have no, we? not since um, you... Not since... Um, over the garden wall, let's say, is the first one that springs to mind. Yeah, I got really angry about that. Why? I don't know. Twenty twenty three is all about the love, George. Is wrong all... about it and it confused you. Um, <laughs> um <laughs> up top, small announcement to make that we uh, were conscious that we were having some really awesome discussions recently in the White Lotus episodes and in the episodes you're going to hear coming up soon, etc. And we realised our episodes were running a little bit long. So, rather than give you a huge, great big um, sandwich every two weeks, we're going to give you a smaller snackable every week. Because what we're going to... But you're going to get all the same content you normally get, but spread over two weeks. Because what's going to happen is we're going to go... One week, this week, for example, you're going to hear our culture catch-up discussion uh, where we're going to talk about a few films and things, etc. that we've watched over the past week. And you're going to hear our MyTube discussions. And then next week will be the culture bucket of our lives. That will be the special top five or review or whatever special element we're doing in that two-week span. And then after that, we'll do a culture catch-up and then the next special thing. And it's going to go like that. One week on, one week off for culture catch-up. One week on, one week off for... The special. It's very simple. Once it starts going, you won't really notice the difference. You'll just see every week you'll get a lovely episode from us. And they'll be about an hour long rather than like two and a half hour long. So it might be more digestible for you. If you think this is a terrible idea, I'm not sure why you would. <laughs> yeah. But if you do, then just let us know. If you think it's a good idea, let us know. If you don't have an opinion, then no. just email us a blank <laughs> um, page. So... Uh, in line with this being the year of love, please love us by going to um, the social media places and everywhere else and following us, interacting with us and rating us and reviewing us, please, on Apple Podcasts, and Spotify and anywhere else you can. And from this episode, you have got an even more exciting way to support us if you'd like to with uh, cold, hard cash uh, in the form of coffees. Which you can buy us at buymeacoffee.com. What's the website called, Alex? Uh, you can find us on Linktree, on our Linktree. Uh... Go to our Linktree, yeah. not on Instagram, though. No, it now it works. Linktree okay. went down, and then, yeah. But I think it's individual users. I don't think it, it breaks for users. So people. It, links on Instagram are annoying, but find us on TikTok and elsewhere by searching Culture Bucket Podcast. Uh, and looking at all the there's links in the in the show notes as well uh, and go and follow the links to linktree to then follow the link to buy me a coffee.com yes and uh, you could buy us a coffee and it would help to to um rather than buying coffee we'd probably spend the money on the hosting costs of the podcast etc which would be lovely mm. um so yeah please do buy us that coffee if you want to and if you can because it's a difficult time. Energy bills are high. I've sold my clarinet on eBay. I'm making my own hummus. It's tough. The end times are here. How did I not know you had... Did you used to play the clarinet? No, that's a joke. I don't have a... Okay. <laughs> I've known you for years. It's a peep show joke. Uh, Any peep, peep show fans will be rolling on okay. the floor. So, we've got the usual culture catch-up. My tube. And I'm excited about my tube today. Oh, why? Yes. I've got one video to share with mm, you. Okay. And it's 10 minutes long. 
but it doesn't feel like 10 minutes. Okay. And it's taken the world by storm. Z. So I think you'll... <laughs> <laughs> what? I think you'll... um. I think you'll have it will be it's a surprising piece of work. It's a it's a thing. Everyone I've shown it to has had an opinion on it. So okay. I'm excited to hear yours. I'll definitely have an opinion on it. Yes, I have and and of that. Yes, you do. And after that we'll be talking about the wonder, our homework, our tardy homework, yeah. finally. Mm. Um I watched that movie in another lifetime it feels like now, but Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to remember <laughs> what happened. <laughs> but let's start with culture catch up. Culture catch up. Um, now, this is culture catch up time. This is where we talk about what we've watched, what we've read, what we've listened to, and probably some other stuff. And it's my turn to start. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, first of all, the thing I've been most excited about happening uh, in pop culture finally happened. The HBO adaptation of The Last of mm. Us has finally started. Oh, I didn't know. Did they make an adaptation? Shut up and um, <laughs> never heard of it. <laughs> and um, it's had two episodes so far, and both episodes have been spectacular. Mm. And I will talk more as it goes through. Um, and it's been one of the biggest shows HBO has ever launched, and is massive, and everyone's talking about it. And any podcast that chose to do like an episode dedicated to it would surely get a bump in downloads as a result of highlighting it. Just putting that out. There. I don't. I don't know what you're talking about, though. Mm. Mm. Have you watched it? What do you think? No. Yes, I have watched. Oh, it, you actually. have watched yeah. it. Oh, you're such a. <laughs> you're so angry with me on Instagram. Foul no, tease. No, on the WhatsApp. When you said it wasn't, <laughs> you said it wasn't your thing, and I was like, "You like zombie stuff? What the hell are you talking about?" I love that chat. You're like, "Why are you not watching it? You need to, you're trying you're trying to like make a case about me watching it." And I was like, "I'm not watching it. I'm not interested in it." It drove me mad. <laughs> it made me angry for days. I thought you'd be angry. I just like, but I'm not going to tell him that I'm watching it. Oh, you suck. I've been annoyed for two weeks about that. Oh, do you not think I was going to watch it? I, no, because you said it wasn't your thing. And I was like, what? And then you said I haven't even played the game. And I was like, she's a moron. She loves zombie things. It's not just... But it's not zombies. <sighs> it's fun guy. Yeah, but then it usually if you <clears throat> tell me you don't want to do something and I start questioning you on it, you get all angry and have a go at me. So I just, instead of... <laughs> Pushing it, I dropped it and stewed on it like a fool for weeks, literally weeks. <laughs> Two weeks. Mm. I'll share the chat if you want. <laughs> Feel put free it on to Instagram. post it. Put it on and buy me. You can only, you have to buy us a coffee to see my passive rage. <laughs> yeah, because then I think you stopped talking to me. Yeah, I did. I yeah, think you just yeah. like stopped the chat. Yeah, because I was, I was like, the only thing I wanted to do is try and convince her to watch it, and she's just going to get annoyed at me like when I do that. So I'm going to stop talking to her for now. I nearly, I nearly put James, I nearly mentioned James Cord as like uh, <laughs> Corden's new um, show, Mammals, and I nearly put, oh, if you watch that, if you watch Mammals, then I'll watch The Last of Us. But I didn't want to push it too far. <laughs> Good, thanks. <laughs> yeah. All right then. Well, so you've seen it. Yeah, both well, episodes. I- Okay, well, as someone who's not a game playing yeah. person, what do you make of it so far? Um, well, the first act, you know, when we before everything happens, oh, is yeah. uh, pretty incredible on how they were so. It still feels a bit like a video game, which is interesting. Mm. because certain things happen off camera. So like she falls asleep and then everything else has happened. Like in a video game, you don't see what happens. It is explained to you. And that right. happens quite often. And I quite like that. Okay. I think it's quite interesting. Um, uh, the moment where all the shit hits the fan, when she wakes up, she goes, the daughter wakes up and she goes in the house. And then... Joel arrives and is all like, ah, I love that bit. And I kept shouting, stay in the house, stay in the house, stay in the freaking house. Um, and then the plane comes down. It's freaking incredible. Oh, yeah, that's it's crazy. Insane. That insane. And then I knew the daughter wasn't going to make it. I still was surprised and sad about it. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's very exciting in bits, but it's very slow in other bits. And that's yeah. how it reminds me like a video game. So when in the second episode that I watched last night, when they're trying, was it last night? Or the night before? No, maybe it's the first episode. No, in the first episode, when they are going up the elevator shaft and mm. they see the blood coming coming out of the door. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then they open the door and there's been a shooting, like there's been a fight. Yeah. That is definitely like a video game. Yeah. And so there's like moments where it's like nothing is really happening, but something has happened before and that's quite exciting because you don't really yeah, see... Yeah, because the, the, because we keep, the perspective is staying with the character yeah. that we're following. Yeah. It's Joel and yeah. then Ellie. Yeah, and so people disappear and then come back magically. And it's like, oh, wow. Um, but yeah, the second episode was pretty fun. Yeah, the bit in the museum with the clickers. Jesus, the clickers are ugly. Yeah, that's a very, very iconic moment in the games and they, they, they adapted it pretty perfectly. Yeah, and also it helps that, you yeah. know, Pedro Pascal uh, scary. is amazing and Bella Ramsey, apart from the first episode, some like teething issues, she just gets into it in the in the in by the end of the first episode and the second episode. Yeah, because Ellie's a really tough character to play, I think, because she's grown up in that world, so she's not scared in the way that you'd expect like a young girl yeah. to be scared, yeah. thrown into that. Yeah. And she's she's very like you know, she's she she's very sort of uh I can't find the right word. She swears a lot and she's she yeah. treat, treats it all of like a bit of a not a joke, but mm. she doesn't take it as seriously as like Joel who has seen more people die probably than Ellie has. Yeah. Although I think Ellie's seen her show of death. Uh Joel is like constantly on edge and scared of everything. Yeah, definitely. Um and those two characters working each other out over the course of the series should be well, I mean that's where the joy in the game is, so I'm sure that yeah. In the show it will continue in that respect. And is this the Last of Us, the first one? Yeah. Yeah. So this season is going to, um, this season is going to adapt the game, mm. um, the first game. Yeah. They just announced. I think it had the biggest viewership increase between episode one and two of any HBO show ever, mm. or something. It's been huge. So, and it's had like the best reviews. I think the first episode is the best reviewed TV episode on Rotten Tomatoes ever or something ridiculous like that. Um, mm. So it's been a day. They, they pre- renewed it for season two yesterday yeah. as we're speaking. Okay. And the creators have said that um, it's going to adapt to the second game, but the, se- the second game is much longer than the first game. Mm. The story is much more involved. So it's going to take multiple seasons of television to adapt yeah. it. Which makes me think they're doing it in the right way. Because the second game is one of my favourite stories. It's probably my favourite story ever. So I'm hmm. excited. One of the reasons that maybe I wasn't going to watch it. I just don't want it to become this super pa- super series where they're like 65 seasons, you know? Like if they're going to be like The Walking Dead. They've got, yeah. I don't know how many seasons there are. But they've. I think, I think if they just can make like a few good seasons. Th- so like the people that are making it. Like, as well as Neil Druckmann, who mm. made the games, mm. um, he directed the second episode, actually, which is amazing to go from a video game developer to a yeah. TV director and make something that good. Anyway, the other guy that's involved is, I think it's called Craig Maslin, or Craig Maslin, and he is, um, he made the Chernobyl limited series oh, yeah. on um, on HBO. So I think, he, I think he sees the value of making something and you know telling your story and getting mm. out and not stretching out too long and yeah. i think hbo more than say uh, was it abc or Show, I think showtime that made the walking Dead. i think hbo also see the value in not stretching something out too mm. long um and i could see them doing like they'll adapt to the story of the second game across two seasons yeah and then if the third game i think there's they've not even announced part three yet so mm. if there's no third game by the time the sec- that that finishes then that should be the story, and you could um, you could adapt, you could do three seasons adapting the first two games and that would be one self-contained story mm. and you could stop there and it would be fine. Um, mm. So, yeah, I know what you mean. I don't think it will become mm. that huge thing, um, you know, in terms of the number of seasons and things, but we'll just have to wait and see. So what are your thoughts about the first, because I'm not a fan and I enjoyed it, what are your thoughts about the first two episodes being a super fan? Um, loved it. I'm currently playing the PS5 remake of of that of that of that game. Um, mm. 
So I'm sort of playing through the events in the game before watching the episodes because I'm a lunatic obsessed <laughs> with it. Um, and I think they've done an amazing job. Like in terms of just like the craftsmanship on display is incredible. The level of detail and work that has gone into a adapting the game, but b expanding the world. Like for example, episode one opens with um, set in the sixties on a TV chat show, and they're talking about mushroom oh, yeah. and fungus. Not none of that's in the game. Um, and that's a really nice way to set it up. And then, did you notice, or I didn't notice, like you'd have to watch a YouTube video about it like I did, but in the first episode, in that pre-prologue bit, uh, none of the characters uh, eat flour. They all avoid, like unconsciously avoid eating anything with flour in. Like Joel talks about how he's on the Atkins diet, so he's not eating any carbohydrates. Yeah. And um, Sarah gets offered the cookies, and because they're oatmeal cookies and not chocolate chips, she doesn't eat them. Ah. Um, and that's where the cordyceps virus is it's in flour so that's kind of like it's just a tiny little thing but it's kind of like here's why they didn't get infected here's a reason that you can kind of cl- look at wow. um, and then of course in the set and on the tv they talk about how in jakarta there's been a big um crisis at the world's largest or like in J- jakarta is where the world's largest flour and grain processing plant is and then episode two opens with a little Pre- prequel bit set in Jakarta yeah and it's like oh that's where it started because that's where all the flowers it's a great it's like they've really thought they've, they've applied the same level of consideration and care to this video game story as they did to the real story of Chernobyl and um mm. I think it's paying off as a result I think it's I think it's brilliant and I'm enjoying it so far uh the next episode will almost certainly be the one that has Nick Offerman in it and you know he's great so the uh, next episode should be should be a fun one if they if they fuck then that it will be a fun one because I know what the story's going to be. Um, yeah. So it will be a good episode. And um, yeah, I just can't wait for everyone else to... Like, the opening of that game is brilliant and the stuff we've seen so far is great. The ending of that game, the last few acts of that game that will form the last few episodes of this season are amazing. Mm. So um, I think everyone at the moment is going, yeah, you know, it's pretty good. Um, if they've done it correctly by the end, everyone will be like, wow, that was something else um i think pedro pascal is killing it as um joel Mm. um yeah he's doing a really good job and i think bella ramsey you know i remember the first time you saw her when she was like i don't know eight years old or something or 10 in game of thrones and she just commanded the scene she was in despite being surrounded by like respected british character Mm. actors who were all 40 50 years old and the and since then we've seen her in Catherine called Birdie, which she's yeah. great in. And now this and she's just she's just great. She's really good. She's like the bit in this episode where she pretends briefly to be infected and is doing that and stuff yeah. and she's <laughs> yeah. just she's just very good. Mm. She's very, very good. Yeah. Um and you know, the the HBO do this thing where they get two two lead actors from a show to like interview each other on YouTube. Mm. Um, because the House of the Dragon, the two sort of lead characters in that did it, and they've done one for Bella Ramsey and Pedro Pascal, <clears throat> yeah. and they just seem like a couple of goofballs, and I like them. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm glad that they're, you know, I'm glad that they're leading the way on this. So yeah, yeah I'm pretty. I think pretty... she's a really, really fun person. Like, yeah, she I've, seems I've, it. I've heard, you know, I've seen interviews with her and um, the cast of like Catherine Cole Birdie, and they all like adore her. Like she's mm. amazing. So she just seems like a really nice person. Yeah. Mm. And good. I'm glad for her. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> cool indeed. Gotcha. Well, that's The Last of Us TV show. Um, yeah. I'm glad you watched it. Well done. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few films I've seen this week now, and then we can move on to you. So I went to see the 2022, although in the UK technically 2023, psychological drama film Tar. Mm, tar. Yeah, directed, written and directed by Todd Field, um, who is a very well-respected director, but I think he's only this is only his fourth film across like a 30-year career or something crazy. Mm. Um, and starring Kate Blanchett, who is, everyone, you know, everyone loves Kate Blanchett. Although this week I saw a video that made me hate Kate Blanchett. Oh, is the one on Graham Norton? Yeah, yeah. Where she says, "Does anybody like metal?" Yeah, that was really weird. Yeah, yeah to Mar- to Margot Robbie seconds after, um, Margot Robbie has said how much she likes Slipknot. Yeah, and then Kate Blanchett just kind of goes, "Does anyone like heavy metal?" Yeah, shut up. And she taught herself how to be. She learned how to be a conductor for this film and mm. immersed herself in the world of classical music. Mm. And 
there's almost no popular genre of music that owes more of a debt to classical or has mm. more of a link to classical music than heavy metal in a lot of ways. Mm. So um, she's a moron. I don't you're like dumb. her. You're, no, you're... let's not. Come on. Sometimes people say things that they don't really mean in the in the. I moment. know, but then she says a couple of other things in that brief clip that just I made know, me go. Ugh. I know, but she's taking some time. Maybe I think this role made it. It was so intense because I've heard it was is a kind of intense role, and maybe she's a bit uh out of it, and she's going to take some time off. And I'm sure she's lovely and nice, and she just said something without thinking about it. So. Tar, starring the controversial Kate Blanchett, um, directed yeah. by Todd Field. It's a long movie. It's 150 minutes long, uh, which is mad for for like a film like this because it's effectively it's essentially a biopic of someone that doesn't exist. And the, the the kindest thing you can almost say about it is that there's lots of people who've watched this movie and think it's a biopic of a real person. Ah, oh, um, it's not because it's so <laughs> accurate. No, it's not. Oh, did you think that? Well, I just watched the trailer and saw your review on. Oh, fair play, fair play. But oh, yeah, so oh, letterboxed. Yeah. So Kate Blanchett plays Lyd- Lydia Tarr, um, a world famous composer slash conductor. The film opens with quite a long sequence where she's being interviewed on stage uh, in New York by um, a guy called Adam Gok- Gopnik, who is a real interviewer uh, at the New Yorker. So th- there's all these things throughout the movie that sort of link it to the real world and play it places itself very firmly mm. in the real world in a way beyond most movies um that that are set in the real world mm. um for example like so this this guy who's a real guy is interviewing her at the start of the movie and she starts listing off real composers that she respects um and conductors and stuff and one of them is uh, Hilda Gunner's daughter who did the score for Chernobyl and uh, Joker mm. and this film itself which was a nice little sort of easter egg almost so anyway and the movie kind of follows Lydia Tarr as she prepares to conduct um, I, I'm not an expert on classical music but some kind of a big important thing Mahler's Fifth <laughs> Symphony she's with the Berlin she's she's been she's been the lead conductor of all the big orchestras um, across the world Okay. Whatever they whatever they may be, and now she's at the Berlin, which is wow. you know the final one, and she's conducted all of Mahler's symphonies except for the Fifth Symphony. So she's going to conduct the Fifth Symphony, and that will be the crowning achievement on her career, and it will be released as some kind of special box set. And she's about to launch a book called Tar on Tar, which is a an autobiography she's written of herself, kind of thing. Um, and she's sort of on top of the world in the world of classical music. And you follow her for two and a half hours as her life kind of slowly disintegrates due to what the movie has been described as being about cancel culture. So she sort of becomes cancelled over the course of the film. Um, and she's getting cancelled now for not liking... Um, well, is she getting... Ca- who's who's no. cancelling her? No, nobody. She's not being cancelled. I mean, like, like... You don't like anyway. her anymore, though. Yeah, but I'm not cancelling her. I can't. I don't have the power to cancel Kate Blanchett. <clears throat> you never know. And I and I watched the movie, and it's a good. I, spoiler: it's a good film. I liked it. <laughs> um, she, yeah. And the thing, one of the things I like about the movie is it will change. It will change location, alarmingly in unexpected places. Uh, and it keeps you constantly on your toes trying to follow what's happening what's happening and you know if you've paid any attention to the to the talk of about the movie before you've gone in that it is about cancel culture and that she gets cancelled in the film but the interesting thing about the film is early on there's a scene quite a long scene that's shot in one take of her lecturing at a um Juilliard school of music and she behaves in a way where you're like oh that is mm, not great choices you made there Lydia um her treatment of like um someone but it's done in such a way where you could almost you can kind of see her point of view if you, if you have one mind you'd see her point of view mm. if you have another mind you'd see the student's point of view um but then the real things that she actually gets cancelled for aren't really front and center in the movie and it kind of leaves you constantly trying to work out how you feel about Lydia Tarr whether you're sympathetic towards her whether you think she should mm. be cancelled and it's quite you know it's it's quite it's done quite cleverly and it's done quite well and I enjoyed it and it's a it's a good film it is almost it's the most surprising video game adaptation <laughs> of the year in some ways it, it it links in with the world of video games in a very unexpected and fun way so if you're if you're a big gamer 
you might get a kick out of um, one particular part of this movie close to the end. Mm. <laughs> um, outside of that, it, it's firmly set within the world of classical music, and that's pretty, pretty boring to me, but it manages to make it engrossing and captivating and entertaining. I think that's the mark of a really good film. Yeah. A, a film that sets itself firmly within a certain world or industry. If you could, if you can make yourself entertaining and entrenched and entrancing to someone who isn't interested in that world, then you've mm. done a pretty good job. And yeah, Tar is Tar is a good one. And Kate Blanchett will almost certainly win the Oscar. And she probably deserves to. She's it's a very good performance. I wish that she was less um dismissive of the things I like, but Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> uh, then I went to see a movie starring the other person in that conversation on the Graham Norton show, Margot Robbie. Yes. Because I went to see the movie Babylon. 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 Not Barbie. That's later. Yeah. This is Babylon. <laughs> Babylon is a movie. <laughs> it is a movie. <laughs> directed, direct, written and directed by Damon Chazelle, who's made some of the best films of all time. One of the best films of all time, I should say, uh, in Whiplash, um, his masterpiece debut. Since then, he's struggled to recapture the perfection of that film. Uh, with La La Land, which I enjoyed at the time, but in years since I've sort of been never really felt any need to ever revisit it. No. Um, Sorry, I don't like it. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> and he made he made a biopic of Neil Armstrong with um, Ryan Gosling, which I haven't seen because I, I mean, it's I'm sure it's very good, but I don't really care. Um, <laughs> and now he's come back to us with Babylon, and this is one of those films where like a director will be like, I've been planning this movie the whole time. I never was had never had the power in Hollywood to make it. It, it was the budget was so big, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I had to wait until, you know, I was able to make it, and now I'm able to make it. And basically, it plots the rise and fall of Hollywood from the silent era to the sound era. And when I say rise and fall, I mean sort of like the way that the stars of silent cinema struggled to. Mm bring themselves into the world of sound and it really does it really does have like um it sort of shows the world of silent cinema as being this big non-stop orgy party uh the movie starts with like a half hour long orgy basically in a mansion um where you meet your mate you meet your main characters you're going to follow you meet margot <coughs> robbie's um what's her character called nelly Leroy. Uh, Brad Pitt, Jack Conrad. Um, he's a he's he's like the world's biggest movie star in silent film. Uh, Margot Robbie's Nelly Leroy is an aspiring actress who's looking for her big break, and Manny, played by Diego Calva, who is a film assistant from Mexico, who wants to have who who just wants to be within the industry somehow. Um, there's various other people that people that come and go, but they're the big stars of the film that you follow. Um, and that half hour long orgy sequence thing is pretty spectacular. Mm. There's a jazz band playing the entire time. Uh, and it's all sort of lightly choreographed to the music. Um, it builds this point of Margot Robbie dancing on the bar and dancing up against Manny, and she's incredible. And there's an elephant that comes through the room and somebody's died and flees there for some reason. And the whole thing is just... <laughs> from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. <laughs> yeah, from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And the whole thing is just mad. And it's great. And then it goes to, and then basically this this orgy sequence ends with them being like, right, we've got to go out into the desert, we've got to film, and the person who was meant to be in the movie is dead, so Margot Robbie's going to do it instead. So that's how Margot Robbie gets a big big break. And the next big sequence in the movie is this day out in the desert where, like, Brad Pitt's movie's being filmed and Margot Robbie's movie's being filmed and six other movies are being filmed. And because it's silent cinema, it doesn't matter that all these like sets are all next to each other because there's no sound to pick up. So they're all just filming and it's like there's a battle sequence and people are getting killed in the battle sequence because there's no safety regulations. Mm. And there's a guy with a sword through his, like a spear through his chest and the producer's just like, oh, that was an accident. He did that to himself. We all knew he had a drinking problem kind of thing. And it's just like the Wild West and it's manic. And Margot Robbie has her has her shot at stardom and she blows everyone away with this sequence she films where she's like dancing on a bar in a wild west saloon and brad pitts gets all drunk and he can't do his scene but then he, they're losing the light and manny has to go and get a camera and he drives an ambulance back so he can and again it's about another half hour long sequence that's just 
mad and it's like wow hollywood in the silent cinema era was crazy and this is entertaining and then because what he wants to do what damon chazelle wants to do is he wants to show us how much more boring the sound era was when morals came in and people started saying no you can't do this and you can't do this and you can't do this and it all has to be like this that once that happens about 90 minutes into the film the rest of the movie is the most distressingly dull slog of a thing I've ever had to sit through, enlivened only by one amazing 15-minute sequence that Toby Maguire's in, and it's the one bit of the movie he's in, and he's incredible <laughs> playing this. I can't even begin. The movie, for 15 minutes, when, to- when Toby Maguire turns up, he's playing a character that you would only usually find in a David Lynch movie, and for 15 minutes it becomes a David Lynch film, and it's great. <laughs> and then it goes back to being the mad thing. It is. It ends, it takes about half an hour to end, the actual ending itself is the worst thing I've ever seen. Oh, um, I don't want to spoil it too much, but it, it, this movie set in the night between nineteen twenty and nineteen fifty something, the ending of it, it finds a way to involve footage from the movie Avatar. That's the kind of thing we're going with. Bad. What? Hated that. Mm. And it's weird because the movie, like Margot Robbie's great in it. Yeah. Brad Pitt is Brad Pitt. whatever in it. He's not nearly as good as he was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but he's fine. Diego Calva, who everyone said has given him, you know, he's an unknown actor. He's given a star making turn in this. And yeah, pretty much he is. He's, he's very good in it. It's a pity the movie itself doesn't really hold up to that. And it, it's also a pity the movie starts with all this energy. Mm. And then purely because of the story that's being told, it all gets sucked away. Yeah. But the movie doesn't find any anything to replace that energy with. And it just sort of crawls over the finish line. And if they'd wrapped up that last hour and a half much faster, it could have been quite an entertaining movie. But it's not. Oh, the other. There's one more really good set piece where we see Margot Robbie's character filming a movie in sound for the first time, and we experience what it would have been like to have suddenly had to consider that, like, you have to keep sets quiet now, mm. and any noise is a problem. And the guy doing the sound is freaking out at any tiny sound, <laughs> and that's quite entertaining. And Margot Robbie's getting more and more worked up with every take that gets ruined because somebody coughed and something. So, it's a pity because it looked good. The trailers looked exciting. It yeah. starts off really well, and then it just. By the end of it, you fall in, you fall in apart. But never mind. That, that's Babylon. Not, not, not a big recommendation. I'm supposed to go and watch it tomorrow morning. Would you recommend it to me to watch mm. it? Because it's like it's like an infinity. It's it's like three hours or something. Yeah, it's three hours and ten minutes. Yeah. You know, my attention span <sighs> is really short when it comes to <laughs> things. I mean, I'd like to know what you think of it. Mm. But I wouldn't really recommend it to anyone. Yeah. Like uh, it, now, now I'm not sure if I'm going to go and watch it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um. Anyway, then I went to see uh, a movie. I'll talk about this one very quickly. It's it's a 2023 folk horror film. You know how much I like a folk horror movie. Yes. Directed by John Wright, uh, who's previously made Irish horror film uh, Grabbers. This one is also set in Ireland. Um. That was said the name of it. The name of it is Unwelcome. Oh. Um. It follows a young couple, um, Maya and Jamie. Now, Maya is played by Hannah John Kamen, who you may know from uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Um, she plays Ghost in that. She was in Ready Player One. She's been in Game of Thrones. She's going to be in the upcoming Thunderbolts, reprising her role from Ant-Man and the Wasp. Um, and she was in a show on Netflix called The Stranger. She's an accomplished actress, and she's good. Her <laughs> husband, Jamie, is played by Douglas Booth, who's the worst thing I've ever encountered in my life. <laughs> Um, okay, so two two opposites. Yes. Also starring, <laughs> we've got Jamie Lee O'Donnell, who is from uh, Derry Girls. Ah. We've yes. got Colm Meany, who, if you looked up a picture of Colm Meany, you'd recognise him. He's been in everything and everything you could hope to see, uh, and he's great. Um, and Christian Nairn, who played Hodor in Game of Thrones, which um, is pretty nice to see him in something, along with a few other um, pretty pretty good character actors. Basically, at the start of this movie, Maya and Jamie, they're living in uh, London on like a council estate kind of place, uh, a bit rough. She just finds out she's pregnant, well excited about it. Some rough street types break into their flat and try to kill them. Uh Uh-oh, oh oh no. no. Then Jamie finds out he's inherited a big house in the countryside of Ireland from his aunt who's died. Nice. And they're like, do you know what? People here are literally breaking into our house and trying to murder us. Let's go and live in this house in the countryside instead. So they pack up and they move to Ireland. They get to the house. Neve, the local barmaid or owner of the local pub, 
um, shows them around the house because uh, she's an old friend of the aunt that's died and everything seems lovely. And then right at the end of the um, of the introductions and stuff, Neve says, there's only just, just one more thing I need to tell you about. It's a little bit odd, but just come with me. And she takes him around the back of the house to the back of the garden and there's a gate in the garden wall that leads into the forest behind the or the woods behind the, the house. And mm. there's a little hole in the wall as well. And she says, right, every day before you go to bed, you have to come down here and leave a blood offering in front of this hole to placate, okay. to, to sate the little people, the red caps. And the if you don't, people. the little people, the red caps. And he's like, what do you mean leprechauns? And she's like, oh no, these aren't leprechauns. And she's like, if you don't, they'll be upset and they'll, you don't want, you don't want them to be upset. Wow. And um, they're a bit like, well, that's mad, but this house is free. So we'll do it. If it's, if it was, <laughs> if it's important to you and it's important to art, we'll do it. But obviously, because they don't really see the value in it, they don't really do it. And things don't really work out well for anyone. No, um, of course not. You haven't fed the, the, the little people. But the little, the little people look like Yoda and they talk like little gremlin things. It's very entertaining. Okay. Um, it's a sort of a comedy horror film, home invasion type movie. It doesn't necessarily go in the direction you expect it to based on that intro in terms of who the victims are and who the villains are and stuff. Yeah. But um, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty entertaining. And then in the final five minutes, it goes absolutely out of its mind and becomes incredible. So it was like a three and a three and a half out of five. And then in the ending pushed it to four out of five for me. But it's very much on my speed. Other people might have a different um, mileage with it. But I loved it. Mm. No, I didn't love it. I did love it. I liked it a lot. It was good. <laughs> Unwelcome. It's a little film. You might not see it about little people. But <laughs> if you have an opportunity to see it, go and yeah. see it. It's pretty crazy. Uh, and then finally, 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 yesterday I went to see The Fablemans. Ah, yes. Steven Spielberg's The Fablemans, the most personal film he's ever made. And you know it's the most personal film he's ever made because before the film starts, he appears on screen to say, thank you for coming to this, the most personal film I've ever made. Oh. And then the film starts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the Fablemans is set between like 1954 and 1964, something like that. Mm. Uh, and it basically, 1952, 1962, and it follows the life of young Sammy Fableman, um, a boy in, a, 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 a boy, a, the son of uh, Mitzi and Bert Fableman, who are a couple of, um, it's a family, they're living in New Jersey. And over the course of 10 years or so, um, Sammy Fableman discovers his love for cinema and sets out on his journey to become a director, ultimately becoming, of course, the most successful director of all time because mm. Sammy Fableman is essentially meant to be a young Steven Spielberg oh. and this is this is the story of his life. Um, it, Michelle Williams plays his mother. She's yes. great. Of course. Paul Dano plays his father. He's great. Yes. Seth Rogen plays Uncle Benny. Um, he's great. And... Various other people turn up and go. Judd Hirsch plays um, his granduncle who used to work in cinema and is one of the things that comes into his life at one point to try that sort of inspires him to get involved in cinema. Mm. And um, in a very memorable scene, a very memorable scene, uh, the very the iconic film director, John Ford, who made The Man Who Shot Liberty, Liberty Valance and mm. The Strain, The Strain, The Searchers, I think, and loads of other films, is played by the actual greatest film director of all time, David Lynch. Oh, oh uh, yeah, I saw him. Yeah, yeah I saw him on a, in a clip. Um, so there's not a lot of David Lynch in this movie, but mm. it's pretty good. And there's the in the in the in that bit of the movie, somebody says to um, Sammy, "Would you like to meet the greatest director of all time?" And it works on two levels because John Ford is one of the greatest directors of all time, but actual in actuality, the actor on screen is also the greatest film director of all time. <laughs> anyway, anywho. Um, I was kind of like, I was like, I'll go and see it because it's a Steven Spielberg movie and it's supposedly a pretty special one to him, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also it's about a boy in the 50s in America and etc. It doesn't fill you with like, oh, yes, go, go, go. Uh, <laughs> turns out it's amazing. It's magical. It made me cry like repeatedly throughout the film. Mm. Um, the things that happened to Steven Spielberg are things that happened to a lot of families but 
are still quite traumatic. There's still well, there's trauma in this film. There's there's traumatic events that would have had a big impact on his life and on him, and really things that kind of like make you realize why a lot of his films deal with fatherhood and dad and like mm. it's it's pretty great to get to be shown this insight into what led this man to become who he eventually became and for him to kind of share this with the world and he must have had a complex relationship with his father and a complex relationship with his mother because the things that happened in the film would be difficult for any family to to overcome and supposedly it's all real it all happened and it's kind of it's astonishing stuff and i and i loved it and like there's little throughout the entire movie there's tiny little touches that just are like little peaks and pokes at his filmography and like mm. you know my favorite film of all time is Jurassic Park there's one particular bit where they go out into the she drives the kids out into the rain to see a tornado to chase down a tornado and they suddenly get close to it and she realizes that she's in more danger than she expected and the rain is pelting the car and it just feels like the bit in Jurassic Park where they're uh, in the car yeah. waiting for the T-Rex and the mum leans back over the seat to talk to the kids and the camera shot, I swear, it's exactly like mm. the shot in Jurassic Park. Where, anyway, um, it's a great film. It's it's really, really, really good. And I'd recommend it to anyone at all who wants to. Like, I love, I absolutely loved it. And it um, is better than I expected. So, cool. The Fablemans. Nice. Um, amazing movie. What have you been doing? Oh, oh finished. Fantastic. Yes, so, very, very good. I, I, I like it. So I watched a couple of series, uh, one on uh, Disney Plus uh, called um, uh, Abbott Elementary. Oh, um, yeah. And it's uh, written and starring Quinta Brunson, which I first knew about her when she was working for BuzzFeed uh, doing content. Okay. Um, yeah, years ago, and I really enjoyed her content in or her whatever they do in Buzzfeed. Is a content well, great content, solid great, content. Is a content what comes? I don't. Know. I suppose it is content. Yeah. Yeah. It's just funny. Yeah. Sorry. Can't yeah, think of not... any other word now. Material. Material. Yes. So I knew, and I really enjoyed what she did in Buzzfeed, and then I stopped. I stopped engaging with BuzzFeed um, and uh, she came out with this. So uh, I watched on Disney Plus, there's only the first season that came out in 2021. Cool. And I watched that. And it's just uh, a, seri- uh, a series set in a school in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, the school, like every school, hasn't got much funding and much support. and But the teachers that work in there are... Uh, very dedicated and they do um they do what they can with what they have and it's kind of like a theme of uh the show that there's nothing there the electricity is terrible they're uh they're trying to the they're trying to introduce um new things but there's not enough money it's uh it's it's just a normal school that doesn't really work but what makes it work are the teachers um the begin the the few first few episodes i wasn't i I had like it took me some time to start enjoying the the series but towards the end especially the last two episodes the comedy was really good and um and it was really funny so the last two episodes are really fun so it took it took a, a while to get for me to get into it but then i i by the end i really enjoyed it also because being a teacher, uh, watching it, you just go, oh, there's all the problems that you every school in every part of the world has. There's not mm-hmm. enough money. Uh, and uh, what makes it are the teachers, but the teachers are underpaid, un- overworked, et cetera, et cetera. So the beginning was just a bit like, oh, I don't find this funny because it's so real. But then mm. um, the more you watch it, the more you're like, oh, you know, you have to find... As, as teacher find the silver lining because you love your job and all these teachers in the series love their jobs and um, it was really bittersweet watching it as well because I left my profession as a primary school teacher and um, <laughs> I just there's some moments in the show that made me feel like this is what I miss about being a teacher like the assemblies and being silly with the kids and you know the teaching part and so 
uh, I felt was like, oh, <laughs> but then the underfunding and the over and the underpaying and the overworking, I don't miss that. So it was kind of like bittersweet watching it. Um, it's um, it stars Quinta Bronson as I did before as um, Miss Teagues, who is I think she's second grade teacher, mm-hmm. and then there's Cheryl Lee uh, Ralph who um, plays amazingly the first great teacher she's, a, she's probably the best uh, part of the show and um the, the one that is the most irritating in the show is the is um the principal played by janelle james and uh, the principal is useless and the reason she's a principal is completely wrong and she doesn't know how to run a school and i have worked with principals like that <laughs> so yeah it's a good series is a it's a nice um it's a nice series to watch um but also if you are a teacher it's kind of reminds you a bit of uh, your job and why you love it and hate it at the same time yes and um have you have you watched it i've watched um maybe three mm. of it i've watched i've watched some of it mm. um I'm trying to remember how much I watched. Three. I've watched three episodes. Yeah. Uh, and enjoyed it, but yeah. I haven't haven't continued with it yet. But I, you know, I've if you watched. if you wanna, if you it gets funnier towards the end and it's really good and they kind of get the cast kind of gets used to each other and it's it's good. Mm, I do find the principal really irritating. Yeah. Dif- difficult to watch. Yeah. Um, I I had a school principal that was pretty much like that that she didn't know what what she was doing and she was just yeah, like always, always very good. similar to that mm? very always good yeah 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 and the what who p- picks up the pieces are the teachers and then uh but yeah i i i think is a good series to watch and i'm looking forward to watching season two which is not out on disney plus in italy yet or in the uk but it's definitely been on hasn't it it's yeah yeah it came something. out in september last year uh, and then I watched a Netflix C series directed weirdly by um one of my favorites Hirokazu Koreeda. Mm. So he's a very busy man. I don't know how he does it, but he does it very well. And it's called The Macanai Cooking for the Michael House. The what? The what? The, the what? Macan- Mac the Macanai Cooking for the Michael House, or Michael San Chino Macanai San. Okay. <laughs> and it's the story about two best friends that come from Aomori, uh, play um, Sumire and Kyo. And they come from this little village in Aomori, which is in the north of, Jap- in the north of Japan. And um, they, wa- they, they went on a school trip to uh, Kyoto uh, and they decided they want to become uh, geikos, which is in the West, we call them geisha. Mm-hmm. But in Japan, they call them geiko. And to become a geiko, you need to go to Kyoto in and train to be a geiko. So they both go from Aomori to uh, Kyoto. And um, during the training, um, Kyo uh, is definitely not, not um, <laughs> meant to be a geiko. Uh, while Sumire, her best friend, is... Uh, you know, she she definitely has what it needs, and so um, the two uh, mothers of the house um, they tell uh, they tell Kyo that they can't um, keep her anymore because she's not she hasn't got what it takes to become a geiko, mm. and uh, but she's lucky that the makanai, which is the person who cooks in the geiko house, um, it hurts herself. And so uh, Kyo, who has a love for cooking, becomes the cook, the micro of the house. And it's basically uh, the uh, slice of life of these two best friends that live in this uh, house uh, with the two uh, geiko mothers and training to become geikos. Um, and um, the one that doesn't become a geiko and becomes the makanai, the cook, uh, she uh, every every episode she makes uh, a different dish and and that's also why I love it. It's a bit like uh, Midnight Diner, you know, when they um, the series where there's is in a 
late night bar where the master makes a dish and this is similar to that where um, Kiyo the Makanai makes a, a traditional dish uh, for uh, the house and it's lovely it shows you Kyoto it shows you like traditional Japanese food um, she makes karage which is fried chicken and you're like ah oh, and then she makes udon and all these things and it's just lovely and it's directed by Irokazu Koreeda so it's got this beautiful family vibe and it's just a lovely series so if you watch something lovely watch the makanai cooking for the Michael house and that is in on netflix and then i watched a couple of films uh one it came out last year in 2022 uh white noise starring oh, yeah. adam driver <clears throat> greta gerwig and Don Cheeto. This is directed by Greta Gerwig's life partner, Noah Baumbach. And uh, what is this film about? Hmm. So this film, uh, so Adam Driver, Jack, is married to Greta Gerwig, Babette, and uh, they have a family <laughs> and uh, stuff happens, basically. <coughs> uh, it's like a family drama uh, that deals with like mundane co- conflicts like the breakfast and uh, dinner and going to work and car and it also deals with uh, uh, the complexity and uncertainty of life so there is also um, a new, uh, natural disaster that happens and they have to escape and then uh, they're having issues is the, the the wife maybe she's a drug addict maybe she's not uh murder there's everything in this <clears throat> big film of everything and um it's interesting it's an interesting film uh a lot of stuff happens and a lot of stuff doesn't happen uh adam driver and Greta greta gerwig carry this film beautifully i don't think if it was them those two it would have been as enjoyable i might have switched it off earlier mm. <laughs> um but they're really great and um it's just this absurd funny weird story about normal life and not normal life my favorite bits were when the family were interacting and everybody has an opinion and they were all talking on top of each other <coughs> and i thought that was really interesting way to film that and do that and I, I more thought about how they did the scene rather than what they were saying so I understand I, I enjoyed how the film was made mm-hmm. more than the 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 plot because it's not really a plot uh, but yeah it, it's okay I think I think if you um, if you are ready to be a little bit confused for a while and uh, watch just lots of stuff happening it's a good film to watch I think um, I don't know if you've watched it. I remember you watched, showing me the trailer and I was really interested in watching it. Yeah, I really want to see it. I just haven't yet watched it. There's been a couple mm. of days when I was going to sit down and watch it and then I ended up watching something else instead. But Yeah. Um, I do want to see it. Yeah. And yeah. the last uh, film I watched um, is a film... Um, so I had to subscribe to Mubi. Uh, Mubi! To watch Mubi! Mubi! I had to just go... Mubi! <laughs> I had to subscribe to Mubi to Mubi! watch uh, to, <laughs> to watch After Sun. So I've got Mubi for three months, and, and there's a lot of there are a lot of films there, and they're all like arty films. And mm. I started a couple, but they were too arty for me, and because so, I'm just like, oh, maybe you should watch something more, you know. Hasht- hashtag too arty for yeah. me. Yeah, I just maybe I should watch something <clears throat> more. You know, less commercial. Isn't, isn't uh, Decision to Leave on Mubi? Decision to Leave. It's the new Park Chan Wook Korean film. Not on the Italian movie, I don't Are you think. Sure. Oh, that's very exciting. Because that's yeah. a good movie, man. You I definitely want to watch. Because yesterday I started two movies on Mubi, and I was just like, oh, it's just. Yeah, it's it was the... just one of them was too New York for me. One was a too too art for me so i found the least artsy film that i could watch okay <laughs> uh called uh the big sick 
Oh, is that on, that's on Mubi? Yeah, that is on Mubi. Yeah. It's bizarre. Yeah. Have you seen it? Uh, no, but I know it's the Kumail Nanjiani film, right? Yes, yes. It's a 2017 film written by Kumail Nanjiani and his wife, mm-hmm. uh, Emily V. Gordon. And it also stars Kumail Nanjiani. And it's about this uh, Pakistani-born, American-living uh, wannabe comedian, Kumail Nanjiani, and uh, that uh, meets uh, Emily uh, during his set at a comedy club. And uh, they start a relationship, which is kind of not serious, but kind of starts becoming serious. Um in the but we as an audience realized that probably can't go anywhere because every time uh kumar goes to um his family's house his mum is introducing him to a new um <coughs> girl because he is going to have an arranged marriage mm-hmm. um but uh so be- once when emily finds out they break up but uh then she gets really sick And uh, he has to assess if he wants to follow his family's plans or uh, be with Emily. And um, yeah, or be with Emily. Um, I think if the film hadn't been based on the story, on a true story, which is how Kumal Nanjani met his wife, um, Emily V. Gordon... I don't think I would have it would have worked. I think the only way this works is by knowing that this is a true story, is a true romance story. In my mm. opinion. So, um it's 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 lovely and the and you know, um Emily is played by Zoe Kazan and I really like like her. She's really, you know, I really like I think she's a great actress. She's got really good um chemistry with Kamal Nanjani. <coughs> You know, she, was she in She Said? Yeah, she's also yeah. in She Said. Yeah, she is good. Sorry. Yeah, I really like her. And um, Ollie Hunter plays her mum, Emily's mum. And so it's, that's a nice addition. Ray Romano plays Emily's dad. I don't know how I feel about Ray Romano, but he's very loud and speaks like this. So it's just sometimes it's just a ah, bit too much. Movie! Movie! Um, uh, Zenobia Shroff, who we've seen in Miss Marvel as the mum, is also plays... Uh, Kumal Nanjani's mum. Oh, uh, like so that's her. really nice to have her. Uh, Bo Burnham is in it. Bo Burnham. Uh, Bo Burnham. Bo Burnham. Bo Burnham. Bo Burnham is in it. Bo Burnham. Uh, so it's it's entertaining. It's fine to watch. It's easy. Um, and it's a nice love story that two people actually met like that. And it's just you know, yeah, nice. they yeah. seem very in love, don't they, Kumail and Emily? Do they? I think so. That's oh. my understanding of the of the matter. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're still together, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they're still together. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, I did listen to Sudan Archives, as I oh, promised. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. It's it's good. Uh, I need to I need to give it a few more listens, a bit mm-hmm. like uh, Scissor. Uh, but yeah, she's uh, entertaining. I like her. Good. It's a good glad. album. I thought you would. Yeah. That's exciting. Uh, and that's <clears> it. <throat> That's it for my cultural catch up. Uh, I love it. Good. Me too. Uh, are you ready to break up the pace with a my tube? Yeah, baby. Let me know if you've already seen this video. Okay. You know what we could do? You what could, could we present, do? You could present it to me, and then we don't have to do three, two, one, and I don't have to go and look for it. 
How do I do that? So you go on the little um, on the little arrow, and you present a tab, best for video and animation. Perfect. So this is the ten minute video we're gonna watch. Yeah, but it should okay. be good. Um, right. So this is this is a this is a song. Although it's not really a song. Mm. It's a it's a piece of it's a performance by someone called Ren. And it's called Hi Ren. Hi Ren. Hi Ren. And I don't want to say any more than that. Okay. Um. Yeah, I've got captions on, so hopefully that will help. Because it, yeah, we'll see. Let okay. me know what you think. I'm gonna start it now. You ready? Yeah. Oh. Ren is on a wheelchair. Mhm. And a pig, a guy with a pig mask has just walked him in and now he's playing guitar and the subtitle says foreign I don't know why because <laughs> it's a foreign language the language of the guitar oh he's very good on his guitar mm. is he a singer? yeah okay yeah it's not just this for 10 minutes so I wouldn't <laughs> sure. okay thank you <clears throat> well, he's definitely a talented musician. Huh? What? So, there's subtitles? Yeah, I think they're just coming a bit early, don't worry about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm like, he's not saying anything. <laughs> Is this his new language? <laughs> okay. <laughs> English. Mm. British. British. Yeah. Okay, so clearly talking to two different people. Mm. Okay. So maybe he's having some mental health issues. Could be. Yeah. I'm not saying anything, sorry. <laughs> it's fine, we can <laughs> listen and then talk. Yeah. Ah, so multiple personalities. Okay. Nowhere. Yeah, but my music's not commercial like that. I never chase numbers, statistics, or stats. I never write hooks for the radio. They never even play me. So why would I concern myself with that? But my music is really connected, and the people who find it respect it. And for me, that's enough. Cause this life's been tough, so it gives me a purpose I can rest in. Man, you sound so pretentious. Ran, your music is so self-centered. No one wants to hear another song about how much you hate yourself. Trust me. You should be so lucky having me inside you to guide you, remind you to manage expectations, provide you perspective. That thing you neglect it, I get it. You wanna be a big deal next to me, Hendrix? Forget it. Man, it's not like that. Man, it's just like that. I'm inside you, you twat. No, it's not, man. You're wrong. When I write, I belong. Let me break the fourth wall by acknowledging this song. Ren sits down, has a stroke of genius. <laughs> yeah, I thought we were thinking about Eminem, actually. And Plan B as well. Plan B yeah. did it. Man, you're not original, you criminal, rip off artist, the pinnacle of your success is stealing other people's material. Ren, mate, we've heard it all before. It's sad and funny. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> I'm like, and I'm like, oh. There's a lot going on, isn't there? Yeah. Music is all about the creative process, and if people can find something to relate to within that, then that's just a bonus. Fuck you. I'ma fucking kill you, Ren. I'ma fucking kill me, then. Let's fucking have you, Ren. I'ma do it. Watch me prove it. Who are you to doubt my music? Because I call the shots, I choose it. Die. 
Yeah, I call the shots until I choose who survives. I'll tie you up in knots when I lock you inside. <sighs> Newsflash. I was created at the dawn of creation. I am temptation. I am the snake in Eden. I am the reason for treason, beheading all kings. I am sin, with no rhyme or reason. Son of the morning, Lucifer, Antichrist, father of lies. Mustopheles, truth in the blender, deceitful pretender, the banished avenger, the righteous surrender. When standing in front of my solar eclipse, my name is stitched to your lips. So you see, I won't bow to the will of a mortal, feeble and normal. You want to kill me? I'm eternal and mortal. I live in every decision that capitalizes chaos that causes division. I live inside death, the beginning of end. I am you, you are me, I am you, friend. Hi, Ren. I've been taking some time to be distant. I've been taking some time to be still. I've been taking some time to be by myself and I've spent half my life ill. But just as sure as the tide starts turning, just as sure as the night has dawned, just as sure as the rain falls soon runs dry when you stand in an eye of a storm. I was made to be tested and twisted. I was made to be broken and beat. I was made by his hand, it's all part of his plan that I stand on my own two feet. And you know me, my will is eternal. And you know me, you've met me before. Face to face with a beast, I will rise from the east and I'll settle on the ocean floor. And I go by many names also. Some people know me as hope. Some people know me as the voice that you hear when you loosen the noose on the rope. And you know how I know that I'll prosper? Because I stand here beside you today. I have stood in the flames that cremated my brain and I didn't once flinch or shake. So cower in the man I've become when I sing from the top of my lungs. I'll stand in your fire, inspire that me to be strong And when I am gone I will rise In the music that I left behind Ferocious, persistent, immortal like you We're a to different sides It's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> It's everything Yeah Yeah and It's one of those videos you just sort of have to watch, isn't it? It's hard to yeah, talk over. Yeah, especially when he's like rapping, it's just kind of. You yeah. need to listen to what he's saying. And. But I think. So. He's not really signed. He's not a big star in any way. He doesn't have yeah. like a label, I don't think. So. Mm. There's not lots and lots of information about him online. Yeah. Um, how, how did you find him? Uh, a friend of mine sent me the video. Okay. And I just watched it. Yeah. And it, it's. I mean. He's got a so he's got a page on like Spotify and well I use YouTube Music. He's got a page on there, and this song isn't on it, so I don't think it's I don't think he's when I was treating it like a song if that makes sense. Mm. It's almost like a statement of intent as an artist or something. I would defeat the forces of evil, and for the next ten years of my life I suffered the consequences with autoimmunity, illness, and psychosis. As I got older. I realized there were no real winners mm. and there were no real losers in psychological warfare. But there were victims and there were students. It wasn't David versus Goliath. It was a pendulum eternally swaying from the dark. Interesting that like an artist like kind of and the more if, intense if he's actually the having these, the the if he actually has this condition that he's talking about really it and put it into music because I've never seen it before. No, and like, um, because I've watched this, YouTube has started showing me a few other things the and there were videos yeah. of him, I think, busking and yeah. he's, he, look, you sort of, he's out in the real world but he still looks like he hasn't, I don't like to say it in that way but it, it, I think he does have, you know, he's not lying or anything about his condition. Yeah. He's, he's telling the truth. Mm. Um, and it's, I must not forget. We must not forget. That we are Interesting. So what did you think? Very interesting. <laughs> it's good. Uh, there's a lot. There's, uh, you know, you have to be, pay like real attention to it. 
Yeah, there's a lot and, going on. Uh, he does have yeah. actual music. He's got like a couple of albums and things on his uh, yeah. on his page. Um, and he, you know, if you look at YouTube comments on his videos, he, he, I think he must have been like wherever he lives, he's very well known in that local area as like a local um, musician. Yeah. Um, and I guess now he's getting a bit like that video has got millions of views and it only went up quite recently. Um, but yeah, we didn't talk much over it, but uh, go and watch Hi Ren on yeah. YouTube because it's uh, good. It's impressive stuff. Definitely. Good. So that was that was that was Hi Ren. Um, are you right to move to homework? Sit down at the back and be quiet and get out your book because it's time to discuss your homework. No. Okay, so we agreed to watch The Wonder, a Florence Pugh movie from 2022. Hmm. Uh, wherein Florence Pugh plays a Victorian nurse who is dispatched to a small village in Ireland to supervise or um, to, to watch a young woman who claims not to have eaten for uh, months and the local people are convinced it's a miracle. Um, so she's going to watch her in eight, eight hour shifts um, yeah. and the other time is going to be shared with uh, a nun and there's I guess a slight clash of um, religion versus science there but the movie doesn't go well I guess the movie's all about that in a way but it doesn't really it doesn't use the nun as a character that, to argue with if that makes sense mm. um, the nun the nun is just sort of almost not really mm. a character it focuses very much on, on Florence Pugh's uh, nurse and how she deals with this situation um, and the movie also uh, opens with a sequence set on a soundstage where yeah. an actress explains to us that we're about to watch a movie and the characters within the movie believe in the story that they exist in, even though the actors know it's a story and we know watching it know it's a story, but those characters believe in something. Mm. And it, I guess it's to compare it to the fact that when we're watching a movie, we know it's not real, but we believe it in the moment because of because of the agreement between the filmmakers and the audience to yeah. to suspend disbelief for the duration of the film and it's interesting that they've decided to put that front and center as the movie starts um to, to, for you to think about before the uh, actual story of the film takes yeah. place um what did you think of it um talking about straight away the beginning um unfortunately i understand what they did after but in a way, I was hoping that it would have been. So there's it, the first shot, the first kind of like sequence. Uh, there is the house, and there is a room, and 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 they're in this set. And um, I was hoping that maybe the film would be set in one location only. Right. Yeah. So I kind of was like, oh wow, that's gonna be where the movie's set and nowhere else. But instead, we are in the. Um, Irish countryside and sort of moving around so I was like okay and I didn't see I didn't really understand the point of it and so I was thinking about it and thinking why so I think maybe it should have been a little bit maybe different at the beginning I was a bit maybe just kind of put put off by the beginning oh interesting yeah um but uh it is it is an interesting movie about what you believe in and uh and I I like the first shot then that goes from the set to the boat. I thought that was yeah. really good. So it goes to the boat and it goes straight to Florence Pew. Um and uh it's it's uh well it's a it's a film about what you believe about faith mm -hmm. and it's not a true story and it's just uh but it is a true phenomenon that happened in Ireland about the fasting girls. Um but yeah, it's very well acted by Florence Pugh, and uh, she's amazing and everything. She's really good with accents, isn't she? Mm. And this like yeah, this, she is this just subtle like northern accent, mm. and she 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 carries it really well. Um, and uh, she's she's been in the Crimea War, and she's had a miscarriage, and so she probably suffers from some sort of PTSD, and um maybe some form of depression so she takes laudanum um but then she does something that i didn't understand why she did it so she takes this laudanum and then she pricks her finger and she 
she sucks the blood and then she passes out. Yeah. And I don't know why she did that. But right. then I read that maybe it was like self-harm to feel something. Yeah. But it was interesting to watch and a little bit creepy. But then I don't know why she did it. Yeah. But yeah, it's a very straightforward film about... I, yeah, it probably is just to feel something. Yeah. Because she feels numb. Yeah, but the film is very straightforward. It's very nicely shot. It shows uh, what people believed in uh, and uh, or maybe some still believe in and uh, the reasons why this family did what they did. Um, and yeah, I didn't, I didn't expect that. That was a nice little twist. Mm. I was excited to watch it because I really like Florence Pugh and the story yeah. sounded interesting. I think the mm. way the story ends up wrapping up and the revelations about what's really going on are interesting enough to keep you going. I was I was intrigued the whole time and I liked it. And I liked seeing uh, the actor that plays the journalist that she ends up sort of uh, recruiting as a helper in her schemes and stuff, mm. uh, Tom Burke. Um, I quite like him and he doesn't pop up in much. So that was yeah. uh, that was nice to see as well. He does a, a good performance. But, you know, obviously next to Florence Pugh, everyone seems a little bit... Yeah, worse. terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. I'd recommend people watch it. Yeah. The Me. Wonder. The Wonder. The Wonder. The Wonder. The Wonder way. The Wonder way. The Wonder way. The Wonder way. <laughs> in the island. Right. Um, so, that's some good homework. I like that. Uh, recommendations time i'd recommend people go out and watch unwelcome if they want a good fun time or the fablemans if they'd like to see a absolute masterpiece hmm. what, good what are you going to recommend uh, the, the i would i'm gonna recommend uh the two series i watch abbott uh, elementary and the mac and i cooking for the michael house good picks right so next time uh you're going to join us for the incredible culture book of our lives discussion uh we really have enjoyed recording these um run throughs of the various years of our lives and i hope that you are going to enjoy listening to them yeah can't wait for that and it's been yes. wonderful to be with you today i hope you've enjoyed the episode um go and you know watch uh, all those series and films we talked about go and watch high ren on youtube if you haven't seen that as well and uh come back to us next time buy me a coffee now right yeah right goodbye goodbye love you love you see you soon see you soon bye